This is IAQ Radio, Indoor Air Quality Radio, the voice of the indoor air quality industry, with your hosts, Radio Joe Hughes and the Z-Man, Cliff Zlotnick. And now, Radio Joe Hughes. Good day, wherever you're listening from, and welcome to IAQ Radio Plus. This week is episode 618, and we welcome John Lovett and Dr. Mark Hernandez. We're going to talk about uh, leveraging a new generation of mobile bioaerosol monitors, research to practice before, during, and after COVID. Before we get started, we have to thank our sponsors. Please let our sponsors know you appreciate their support of IAQ Radio Plus. Our marquee sponsor is Instascope at instascope.co. Our association sponsors are the American Industrial Hygiene Association at AIHA.org, the American Conference of Governmental Industrial Hygienists at ACGIH.org, the Cleaning Industry Research Institute at CIRIScience.org, the Indoor Air Quality Association at IAQA.org, the Restoration Industry Association at RestorationIndustry.org, the Institute for Inspection, Cleaning, and Restoration Certification at IICRC.org, and Healthy Buildings America 2021 at HB2021-America.org. Industry sponsors are AEML Laboratories at AEMLINC.com, Particles Plus at ParticlesPlus.com, Gray Wolf Sensing Solutions at GrayWolfSensing.com, TSI Inc. at TSI.com, and Healthy Indoors Magazine at HealthyIndoors.com. And now you can win a cool prize. It's time for the IAQ Radio Trivia Question. Be the first to correctly answer. Simply email your answer to czlotnick at cs.com. Or if listening live, just text your answer from your computer. And now, here's the Z-Man. Hello, everyone. Congratulations go out to Dr. Pat Cafaro in Richmond, Virginia, who was first to identify the term standard precautions, which the CDC established in 1996. The IQ radio trivia question for today, Friday, February 26, 2021, has been sponsored by TSI Inc., an industry leader in precision instrumentation for the monitoring of indoor air. Learn how to expand your IAQ investigations at TSI.com. Here is today's trivia question. Name the term coined by F.C. Meyer in the 1930s, describing a project involving the study of life in the air. Back to you, Joe. All right. Thank you, Cliff. Today, we've got John Lovett. He's the CEO of Detection Tech Holdings, the parent company and creators of Instascope, an air sampling technology for instant mold and air quality assessment results. We've also got Dr. Mark Hernandez. He had all of his, got all of his engineering degrees from the University of California at Berkeley. He's a registered professional civil engineer and an expert on the characterization and control of bioaerosols, both indoors and out. Based at the University of Colorado, he has 25 years of research leveraging forensic science into wide area surveillance and the design of aerosol disinfection systems for the built environment. Gentlemen, welcome to IAQ Radio. Great to have you. Good morning. Good morning. All right. John, I want to start with you. You don't get out much in, on these shows and so on. I, I had to kind of pull you into this when I love it. Um, yeah, oh, there you go. Love it. Uh, anyway, uh, tell our listeners a little bit about Instascope and, and how it went from this military technology to where we are today. Well, it goes back about 20 years. I became interested in the problem of mold in the built environment. And there really wasn't an effective way to get a whole area scan in real time. So I went to a company called Droplet Measurement Technologies as CEO in an attempt to develop this technology. They were a leader in particle measurement for atmospheric studies. In fact, we weren't able to develop it. It's that complicated. We found out through the Ministry of Defense in the UK that they, in fact, did have this technology and it was patented. We, I licensed from them and continued the development under a company that we now have, Detection Tech. Um, 
very complex technology, very interesting. It was originally developed to detect anthrax. Interesting, uh, John. Now, let's go over to Mark for a moment. Um, Mark, you did a lot of the research that kind of underpins the Instascope. Can you tell listeners a little bit about how you verified that Instascope was differentiating between different types of particles? Yeah, I, I can. Um, I'm going to ask for a little bit of visual aid help. Uh, and the other thing I want to qualify is I'm, I'm one of several uh, both academic researchers, either based in a national lab or based at a university or in the military that has vetted this over time. The technology has been around for 10 years, crossing from the military space into the civilian space, and then um, you know, validating its application in the civilian space for other than biological warfare uh, uh, agents is, is really what myself and several other people, Ann Pairing at Colgate, um, other researchers in the UK, Europe um, have focused on Alex Huffman here in Denver. So I, I'm one of several that have done it and all our data kind of collides, but let me show you what's under the hood in this thing. And I think that that's the best way to do it. So I'm gonna share my screen just for a minute. Sure. Here, can you see that okay? Yes, sir. Vetting, that's what we call it. Um, I'm a civil engineer that's interested uh, in translating technology to practice. If it doesn't translate to practice, I'm really not interested in it. So when I saw this, um, that something that I could do, do bioaerosol assessment in real time, um, I met John in 2006 or seven, it was a while ago, started working uh, with them. And this is what the device looks like. It's about as big as a, a wheel on suitcase for an airplane, something like that. Weighs about 60 pounds, easily moved around. Um, and what's under the hood is, is an optical cavity. It's basically a, a fluorescent microscope like I use in the lab. It's got a laser that, you know, uh, optical particle counters have used for years and years. So it's, it's got a basic optical particle counter in it. But what's novel, it's got a couple of uh, UV lamps in it. And those lamps, um, what we call in the academic sector, excite particles. And if those particles exhibit fluorescence, you can get a a signal like you do on your TV, red, green, blue, something like that. And what's unique about airborne microbes and biology in general is if you excite them with ultraviolet light, they can fluoresce or they do fluoresce much like, you know, some of us have blue eyes, others have brown eyes, others have green eyes. We can see biological fluorescence as these things, as individual particles are passed through a conventional particle counter, but this has an added fluorescent signal. And if you look under a microscope, this is what you'd see. You can get a size from the particle counter and under the microscope, you can get a color back. This one happens to be green, um, but you get this RGB signal that you can actually relate to different types of bacteria, fungi, pollens, and so on. So you get good sizing information, you get unique fluorescence information. And essentially what we did is we took this in the lab at, at Colorado many years ago, we can aerosolize whatever you want. I got a freezer full of, you name it, I got it, tuberculosis, whooping cough, aspergillus, you know it, I can do it. We put it in this chamber, aerosolize it at different humidity levels, get, plug the Instascope into that chamber and we get different fluorescence information back, which is very different than conventional pollution, yeah? Diesel soot, road dust, tire particles, you name it, all the stuff that EPA regulates outdoors, that stuff doesn't really fluoresce the same way that biology does. And you get all these unique combinations. Yeah. So you could have red, green, blue, or any combination thereof, just like you learned in kindergarten, the primary colors. And this gives you a basis with which to, and this is what we did. We tested a lot of different bacteria, pollens, and fungi. And these colors up here represent different aspects of the color wheel. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. and the size of the bars of the different pollens, bacteria, and fungi also tell you how big the stuff is. So combined with the color signature, how big they are, the optical particle counter tells us, and the fluorescence intensity, right? Do you have light blue eyes? Do you have dark blue eyes? Do you have, you know, that the depth of color, we can get all that information in, a, in real time. And we can tell you, are you bacteria, pollen, or fungi with a very high degree of confidence? So that's, that's to, to tell you what's um, under the hood. And how we've backed that out, we've published this in peer-reviewed journals and 
um, it's out there being used. Uh, today, we're using it, several others are using it in various different uh, forensic capacities, scanning the interior buildings, backing out the total particle load and the fraction thereof, that's biological. Okay, uh, that's very helpful. Now, let's go back to John for a moment. Who are your typical customers and where are these instruments being used right now? Initially, they were targeted toward the restoration market. Um, during a water loss event, when you start to dry the fans, you know, suspend all of this bioaerosol. Okay, so with the use of Instascope, you are able to tell how much of this is in the air, how long you should leave the scrubbers on and so on, how containment is placed and you can verify your job. In addition to that, pure mold inspectors that have gone away from cassettes, the majority of them, that, and use this, you know, for their inspection real time. Uh, we have some inspectors that that's all they do. One of them in Florida does a staggering amount um, using only Instascope. And they could also, if they wanted to, use the Instascope to kind of narrow down what other, you know, where and what other types of samples they might be interested in taking. Yeah, thank you, Joe. Um, Instascope is a, is a valuable tool for source tracking, okay? And in the, uh, the cases where they do want an aerosol cassette, then that can be done after you've source tracked. So you have, you know, a better ability to position where you think that mold should be you know, based upon what Instascope is telling you. That, that's, that is done with some frequency. And uh, either one of you can answer this. What, what are kind of the, it's not, it's not an inexpensive technology. You know, you, you're, you're talking about a good bit of money for a mold inspector that might be a single, you know, uh, sole proprietor, doesn't have any employees. What type of advantage does this have over, you know, your traditional types of sampling out there? There's a number of things. One, it's real time, so you're not handling the customer and the experience as much. Um, two, it's whole area. Three, it's actually less expensive. Most of our customers pay about 700 a month when they finance it. Okay, so if you do any lab work at all, you're probably spending quite a bit more with the labs. And one of the things I noticed, I have, I haven't, well, actually, I've used it, and I've also been with people who use it. You can also take a hundred samples and quickly, which is not something you can typically do, you know, so it's very helpful in that respect. And you can do sampling low, medium, high in corners and different parts and help pinpoint maybe a little better than, than with the typical tools we have where you might have an issue. So I, I think that's an important differenti differentiation too. Um, let's talk a little bit how, about how it's reported. How do you generate the reports? What do they look like? I don't know, Mark, if you have any slides on that or not. I do. There, there's kind of two ways to do it. Um, one is uh, the commercial versions now actually have a, a printed report. Um, it shows up on an iPad. You can download, download this report. It has size information like a regular particle counter would. Um, and it also uh, differentiates in the different categories that I showed you earlier. Bacteria and fun, uh, viruses are binned in one part of the report, fungi binned in another part of the report, um, and uh, pollens binned in another. So it, it separates that out. Um, but uh, there's another way to do it too. If you're a researcher or you're, you're data savvy, you're good with computers, you can actually dig under the hood. Um, and pull out the raw data and slice and dice that. As a researcher, that's what I do, but I've actually used both um, forms. And I can also share with you some uh, data that I've gotten off the, the commercial version off the iPad and, and give you an example of how we've used that in schools. Got nothing to do with COVID, really focusing on water damage and fungi. So um, what we did was go into uh, classrooms uh, here in, in Boulder Valley School District and uh, scanned those classrooms with the Instascope. We did this side by side with a bunch of fancy other assays that I won't go into, genetic, biochemistry, and so on, expensive, slow stuff that's not practical uh, uh, to use uh, in the field, at least not yet. In any event, um, went into the classrooms and uh, this left axis here is Instascope output, these fluorescent particles. This bottom axis here is air exchange rate 
this right axis here, we're just going to ignore that's, that's micrometer. It's another way to look at fungi. Um, and we did all these schools, lots of classrooms and lots of schools. And the point that you bro both brought up is you can do this quickly. So we can walk into a classroom unobtrusively, even with the kids in there. Kids actually love the machine. They think it's R R2-D2. <laughs> um, and, uh, uh, you know, in, in within a, with a, you know, a fraction of an air exchange rate, get a representative sample in space and time. Both of you brought that up. This is not a static cassette. It actually moves. Um, so you, you can choose where you want a sample and you can get a time and space integrated sample over an air exchange rate. So that's what we did in 12 schools and multiple classrooms in each of the schools and looked at the particle concentration. That's what these little uh, symbols do. But here's what we did. We took the Instascope output as a practitioner would do. We looked at the ratio of biology to not. The total particles are just the optical particle counter output like a TSI handheld would give you. And the fluorescent part is shown in green. That's the biological load. And you can see there's some outliers here. So this was our first four way into rapid scanning of lots of buildings of lots of rooms rep in a representative paradigm that showed, hey, right away, we can identify outliers, yeah? And that's one of the, this is very powerful because it, it lets you know, hey, where's, where's the trouble? And I can focus my industrial hygiene attention on those rooms where the most trouble is evident as judged by what you're breathing in real time. Not what you see on the walls, not what you, you, know, you smell, but the actual biological airborne particle load um, and you can see they corresponded with the fluorescent airborne particle concentrations and other hardcore fancy assays, genetics, biochemistry, and so on. We were able to nail those classrooms. And sure enough, three of the four shown here had water damage um, that wasn't obvious. I mean, we, you know, we found it behind the curtain, but you know, behind this or that. And then sure enough, there was water damage in those classrooms. So this is the first time that I'd used it in that capacity large scale wide area surveillance to quickly identify a what's normal, you know, schools one through whatever, and what's abnormal fast where we could focus attention and resources quickly. So that was um, our first experience in the field in a realistic uh, scenario. Um, so this output is available on the uh, report for the commercial version. You don't have to dig into the data to do that. And what about the, the differentiation between the, the fungi, the bacteria, and the pollen, et cetera, Mark, or, or John, whichever way? How is that reported out? I didn't I go ahead. It's a, it's a graphical output on the, on the iPad that accompanies it, right? So that, that uh, it's been for you much like I just showed you there, right? There's a bacteria bin, a fungi bin, um, a pollen bin, right? Right. So, and then there's a total to not to total to biological and that, that total to biological has been one of the most useful indicators for us in, in research in, in the research realm. Again, all I care about is translating this to practice. I see practitioners using that, but that's been the most robust indicator of all for us is just totally. adding up all the biology, comparing it to the total. Usually that's about 30%, 20 to 30%. And when that's out of, out of that whack, and it'll be different for, you know, your part of the country, uh, Joe, than it is for ours, right? We have different, you know, it's dry and high here in the Southwest and the Mountain West, different biology. But I think those ratios will be particular to season and physical geography. Here, when it's over a third, something's up. And almost always we found it's water damage. Hmm. And that's total biological. What about just the, the fungal part of it? Um, do you have a number on that, Mark? Like, what no, I, we haven't we haven't separated that out and um we always compare it within rooms of the building and buildings like you know each other like we're not going to compare a, a carpeted room to a knot or a wood frame building to a concrete one we're careful about that so the building factors matter but the zip code and the season matter too so um that's at least that's what we think so i i haven't we haven't dug into that deep uh, a, a dive of data, but um, I think, you know, practitioners get used to what they see in their practicing area, right? And you, right. you can get used to this data that way too. What's normal, what's not. Um, 
you know, in terms of, of the bins we talked about, occupancy, schools will be different than healthcare settings will be different than residences, that kind of thing. So the, the context and the metadata matter, but that's what, that's what practitioners are, do, right? You know what's not normal once you get used to your tool, and I see that happening here. Sure. Cliff, you have a follow-up? I do, actually. Um, I, I guess I have two. Uh, because we're talking about water damage at this particular point, you know, typically in a water damage situation, uh, fungi is slower growing than bacteria uh, would be. Um, so I suspect that when you're showing those higher bio loads in those situations, you know, when it's higher than that one third, a certain percentage of that would also be, uh, you know, would be bacteria. Am I correct in that Agreed. assumption? Yeah. Okay. In, in that case, yeah, Cliff. I can't tell you how far after the water damage this occurred. You know, Understood. but um, it, I, I guess it demonstrates the utility as a, as a forensic tool and we can take it as far as we want to, uh, much like you're saying, like soon Thank after you. the event, after the event, after drying's occurred or even remediation ostensibly has occurred. So I, I think this might be an, an also a decent tool to look at the effectiveness of the remediation practice and lowering the total particle numbers and the biological ones. It can be used Agreed. for containment demonstration, those types of things. The, the other question is, last time I saw the machine, I think it was at our last Healthy Building uh, Summit. And one of the things that absolutely fascinated me was uh, on the back of the machine, I pointed to this little port or whatever, you know, that was there. And I asked, you know, what is that for? And uh, the, the, the salesman mentioned that uh, that was to be able to test water. And, you know, one of the biggest issues in the restoration business, particularly with insurance companies, is uh, the IICRC has these classifications. Uh, they have three of them. And it would seem to me that because uh, the classification that people are most concerned about, which is this category three water right. that can sure. have, uh, you know, high contamination, uh, you know, can the machine... Um, you know, confirm whether that water, you know, whether that water would be, would be category three. And I was just wondering how it worked because you're moving around a liquid versus moving around particles. So. Well, the guy that did that work is on here. That's Mark. Okay. It was Understood. originally requested as far as a backdrop by service master. Okay. Identifying exactly what you did mm -hmm. as being a problem. And so we spent a fair amount of time developing this. It exists in most of the instruments today, mm -hmm. okay? And if we bring it to market, um, you know, to the next level, we'd have Mark do more work on it. But yes, it does exist. And yes, it's been used. Okay, cool. Mark, so what's that you say about Mark? that? You, you probably remember better than me because it's been a number of well, years. Well, that, that was the context in which uh, you approached our lab was for the aquatic version of this. Take a water sample. What, what it does literally is that the cliff, the, you know, you introduce a water sample to the back of the instrument. Right. And it literally aerosolizes that water sample into oh, okay. micro droplets that are individually okay. interrogated. Gotcha. In the machine. Wow. Now how that maps to class one, two, and three waters, um, it, that, that mapping has still yet to be done. Is okay. it an indicator? Sure. Okay. But um, I, I think that translation to practice, the abilities there, but we, we have to formally do that, right? Yeah. And, and whoever well, I, the... You know, I, I think in many ways, the indicator is most important because one of the things that happens when a restoration uh, company responds and they're on site, you know, they need to protect their workers and you know, they need to know what's there, what's not mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, this would give them the ability to have a pretty good idea. I, what, I see the, I totally what's, see the what's there and they don't have the time to, to ha be halfway through the remediation job before the test results get back. No, and, I and all, completely, completely yeah. see the potential. We just have to do that mapping. Is Understood. What's those thresholds in terms of, obviously if it's contaminated with sewage, it's three. Right. But there are other indexes that right. put you in the three. If it's been there long enough, it may not been right. really right. that contaminated. Right. But this will tell you the particles in that water and the biological aspect of those right. particles in that water. Um, but it, it has not yet been officially Understood. mapped to the IICRC guidelines. Understood. No, no, it's just- Could be. Yeah. Could be. Mm -hmm. um, 
I got a couple text questions here, and this is a common question whenever we talk about the instrument, and that is, can the can the instrument differentiate between different genera or species of mold, and is that important, um, or are you looking at kind of a new paradigm here? Because you know, in the past, most people have looked at okay, genus by genus or genera, or you know, grouping by grouping, inside versus outside, or from one room to another. Um, how do you handle that? I mean, it, it was originally designed to do that, to separate anthrax out from everything else. That, mm -hmm. that was its original purpose, right? Mm -hmm. So all the other biology floating around in the air, the millions of bugs in that storm that we breathe that we can't see, mm -hmm. they were after anthrax and it, you know, it was definitely a needle in a haystack. So um, that was its original design intent. Um, can, in practice, can it delineate between genera and species at this point? No. But um, we're, we're actually trying to drill down um, by adjusting sensitivities, by di using different calibration techniques and so on um, to be able to do that. Um, as you know, or anybody that's spent time with their face in a microscope, aspergillus looks like penicillium under the microscope, right? Even, even right. the best microscopists have trouble telling those apart. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, what we found is we do get different signals between those two but we haven't found a systematic way yet to separate them. So again, the potential's there. Uh, the research is going that direction. We hope to have that, uh, uh, you know, answer. Where, where's the threshold of what level we can separate things that mm -hmm. otherwise look alike, but, and, you know, you could have fraternal twins, one have brown eyes and one have blue eyes, but everything else looks the same, right? right. So that's, that's what we're dealing with here. So Very common separate bacteria, fungi, and pollens. Within them, the jury's still out on how deep we can go to separate different genera. Some of it comes back to the use case, the intended use case. We're looking for exposure. Do you have high levels of mold? Okay, and we can tell you that through source tracking right away and very accurately, okay? If there is a reason to speciate past that, you can. We have found many people that were pretty convinced they needed to speciate. Once they started using Instascope for the intended use purpose, really didn't feel it was that necessary because they could identify the source real quickly. And, and Instascope is so sensitive. It tends to, if you, if you get close to a source, it just lights up. It's like a Geiger counter. You can see where you have a mold problem. And then we do have capability to go behind walls if you believe there's mold growth there and so on. So the, the use case was never intended to speciate. It was intended as an exposure tool, wide area source tracking as an exposure. I've got another text question here. And this is, I don't, I'm going to reword it a little bit. Um, Mark, during the work in the schools and other work that you've done, have you looked at comparing carpeted rooms and hard surface flooring rooms and, and what kind of differences have you seen? Um, answer is yes. And we do see significant differences. Uh, we see that in schools all the time, right? Commercial carpet and tile. Um, so we do see, um, especially when the kids are in the classroom because of resuspension difference in both biological and total particle loads. I guess that's no surprise. Um, but, uh, we haven't systematically done that. What's in the commercial product, at least, there's a, a metadata acquisition screen that you put in all those factors. So that you, you kind of build your own database um, that you can compare, hey, what are my particle and biological fraction thereof loads for the different areas that I have scanned. So that, that, that metadata acquisition is automatic and comes with it. We have literally thousands of observations that we can crawl back into and look at, Joe, but haven't, we haven't systematically done that across uh, zip codes yet. What, I want to change the, the topic just a little bit, and that's COVID. Um, you know, a lot of schools and other workplaces and so forth they're concerned about you know bringing people back in they're trying to have they're trying to determine if um if their environment's safe if they have enough ventilation and so on and so forth what kind of work have you done with that if any and uh, how can instascope help with that well mark you go ahead because we started last spring you know at denver public schools 
um, doing a, a uh, you know, the initial work with them to assess, okay, the, the, the bio loading and then um, mixing it and diluting it with HEPA filtration. And Mark continued that work in a very extensive study that's ongoing. Uh, he can show some slides, I believe, and, and speak to that. It's very interesting. All of the things you talked about too as a sidebar, the classrooms with carpet, the classrooms with drapes, the classrooms with poor ventilation, it would show up immediately on the initial assessment. Mark, you want to follow yeah, yeah, up? Yeah, sure, I can do that. Um, first of all, uh, I, you know, I, I want to be realistic about the state of this technology and any other for uh, for finding COVID airborne in real time. Okay, so let's. Uh, I, I don't want to found any uh, assumptions that this instrumentation or any instrument out there can actually recognize, quantify. Um, and enumerate COVID in an aerosol in real time doesn't exist. Uh, you know, maybe someday it does. What this does is measure, measure the total biological load, the particle load, and tells you in real time, if you have an engineering intervention, have you reduced that exposure? That's what it does, because COVID's right there with that, if it exists at all. And if it's there, it's present in relatively low concentrations with respect to the entire storm of things that we breathe all day, every day, most of which don't harm us. So in that context, let me, let me talk about the uh, public school survey. Denver Public Schools um, uh, has a lot of buildings and got a lot, you know, thousands of classrooms. And what we did was survey at least 10% of those in a randomized control trial, focusing on the little kids schools, because those are the ones that were gonna come back first. The ventilation and the intervention they ended up buying a bunch of HEPA filter, or actually they didn't buy them, they were donated um, to those public school classrooms. Everybody I'm sure on the show knows what an air exchange rate is. We sampled a lot of classrooms and we got this distribution of air exchange rates. And you can see pretty heavily weighted to the lower air exchange rate size. Um, if, if you look at the cutting edge research that's being published in what I consider probably the, one of the better translational journals out there, the ASHRAE journal, right? It's right in between research and, and practice. Um, this great group at, uh, at Syracuse um, really produced a nice formative publication with some recommendations about ventilation, how to control what the little pig pens do in the classroom. And that is they shed, they deposit, and they resuspend. Some of what they resuspend is likely COVID. How much and all that, that's a research question, right? I've got instrumentation that costs more than your house that I can bring in there and figure that out, but that's not something we can translate to practice. So following recommendations of increasing outdoor air supply, doubling uh, the capacity, we can make all the uh, recommendations you want, but unless you go in and measure it under real time conditions or the real conditions that the kids are in the school, you really don't know how well this worked. And I've got, you know, we got a lot of colleagues who are modeling this, putting stuff out on social media, calculators and all that. But those have a lot of assumptions about ventilation and background until you measure it, you really don't know. So that's what Instascope could do for us. So we went in, we mixed the air in the rooms, we put in HEPA filters and we looked at the effect of those inter engineering interventions using Instascope as a real time reporter for the biological particle load and the effects of mixing and HEPA filtration on, on the operations. So um, that's what we did in Denver. Um, probably like much of the Eastern part of the US, there's a lot of old schools out here, right? Um, and these are legacy schools, beautiful buildings, but a lot of them have radiant heat, unoperable windows, last generation ventilation system, univents and so on, where you know the dampers are set. You can't change them, stuff like that. So they're limited in what they can do. So they chose to, to look at how HEPA filters could help them. They prioritized by knowing the air exchange rates, the lower air exchange rates, right? Some of the schools were actually performing better than CDC guidelines in healthcare settings. So we prioritized these, we put HEPA filters in the rooms and we went in and did a random sampling of HEPA filter effectiveness using Instascope. I'm gonna blind these school names here. Um, and we took a baseline, nobody in there, background, ventilation system running with the legacy dust. This was after the schools had closed for many months with the legacy dust that was floating around in there. 
And this is what we got. This is the Instascope readout of fluorescent respirable particles, right? Small enough that you could breathe them, which is what we care about with COVID. So this is Instascope readout here. This is the background. Then we went in and we, we had some volunteers walk around. We mixed the room air, put a little bit of mixing energy and poof, we saw what these red bars are what was resuspended, mocking the children's activity in the classroom. And it's formidable. Then we turned on the HEPA filters and looked at the reduction and it was significant. And this is again, Instascope looking at the biological load and there's no other instrument can do that. So that's why we wanted to use Instascope in this context. So um, what I liked about it is it's mobile. We can do this with a lot of classrooms in one day. We can move from school to school, right? Like every classroom can't afford an Instascope but a school district could afford a few of them, right? And move them around. The facilities managers can use them, acquire this data. Um, and you can take a look at interventions from ventilation, interventions from HEPA filtration, interventions from bipolar ionization, all the other goodies that we're throwing in the duct um, now. And this can actually tell you in real time how well it's working. So that's, that's that verification piece that we're missing um, writ large that the industrial hygiene community has been doing for flood damage with cassettes, you know, kind of caveman, but now we've got technology can do it in real time. But this verification piece is a big deal because um, not all buildings are the same. They're not ideal, as you all know. And this gives us an opportunity to scan them rapidly in response to um, uh, engineering interventions. So I'll leave it there. Very interesting. What, what we've got to do is we've got to stop and thank our sponsors here for our halftime. We'll be back with the second half of our interview. We've got John Lovett and Dr. Mark Hernandez. We'll be back in two minutes with the second half of the show. Our marquee sponsor, Instascope. More jobs done faster with the future of IAQ assessment technology. Unlimited samples, instant results, and cloud-based data at instascope.co. Our association sponsors are AIHA, Healthy Workplaces, A Healthier World, at AIHA.org. ACGIH, Advancing Careers of Professionals in Environmental Health, Industrial Hygiene, and Safety, Interested in Defining Their Science, at ACGIH.org. The Cleaning Industry Research Institute, See More Deeply Through Science and Research at CIRIscience.org. The Indoor Air Quality Association, promoting the exchange of indoor environmental quality information through education and research at IAQA.org. The Restoration Industry Association, the granddaddy of the restoration industry, network with leaders at restorationindustry.org. The IICRC, a nonprofit standards development and certifying body for the cleaning and restoration industry at IICRC.org. And Healthy Buildings America 2021 in Honolulu, Hawaii, November 9 through 11 at HB2021-America.org. IAQ Radio industry sponsors are AEML Laboratories. Free shipping, great pricing, same-day results with no rush fee at AEMLINC.com. Particles Plus, feature-rich particle counters and air quality instrumentation. Count on us at ParticlesPlus.com. Gray Wolf Sensing Solutions, over 20 years manufacturing accurate, reliable IAQ instrumentation for portable, short-term, and continuous monitoring at graywolfsensing.com, TSI Inc., an industry leader in precision instrumentation for monitoring indoor air. Learn how to expand your IAQ investigations at tsi.com. And Healthy Indoors Magazine, a free online magazine for industry professionals and consumers at healthyindoors.com. Okay, we're back. Second half of our interview, we've got uh, we, we, we've got to get back into the school thing real quick, Mark. There's one thing that, that when John and I were talking the other day, he was talking about the uh, legacy bio load and, and how, um, how important it seemed to be with respect to the exposure in these rooms when, when certain 
uh, mitigation efforts took place. Can you talk a little bit about that, what you find? Yeah, I, I mean, and I'm going to start with the context of COVID, um, and that is there's some emerging evidence in the literature um, that co-exposures um, to airborne particles are important in, in particularly the very beginnings of, of the success of that infection. That started kind of writ large with data from China and Italy um, that showed that the more polluted the air quality, and we're talking about outdoor air quality, ozone particles and so on, um, the higher per capita success of, of the virus. So there were some indications that poorer air quality was a, a, a comorbidity with viral exposure in terms of success of that disease, hmm. right? And it kind of makes sense, right? If, you, if you're breathing lousy air, your lungs are compromised to fight this intruder. So that's kind of where it started. Um, and it's progressed. There's been other research out both in vitro with cells, like you challenge them, lung cells with air pollution of different types, you know, stress the cells and the virus seems to be more successful. That's, that hasn't progressed to animals yet, but we're looking at that. So that's the starting of, of that idea. Um, the, the slides that I just showed you, uh, these were in fact um, from, you know, when I, when I did this uh, little uh, series here, these were in fact from closed schools that we were able to enter. And this series of, okay, I, I measure this background biological load, indoor air, outdoor air, everything combined. And then as we actually disturb this legacy dust, we go in, we stir it up on purpose with a little bit of fan energy and volunteers. We actually go in and tromp on the floor to reenact these kids, right? When the school is closed and has been closed for months, there's legacy dust in there and biology, yeah? So that's what these red bars were. And then we turned on the HEPA filters, bingo, and you know, we were able to take that down rapidly within a fraction of an air exchange rate. That's what this is. So that's, that's where that story comes from. I, I didn't continue the story. This is now same kind of idea. Uh, this is now in lots of classrooms. That's all the abbreviations on the bottom. And you see two bars per each classroom here. The left is PM 2.5, the right is PM 10, the big stuff. So we're looking at that ratio. The green is the biological fraction. The gray is the total particle load. Again, you can get this information and you can see something now, this is what the kids in the classrooms, right? So we looked at the legacy dust, it's efficiency of removal, being concerned about that legacy layer being a, a co-exposure problem. So that has to be pulled down before the kids and you need to verify that happened. Now this is with the kids in and boom, you can see it, right? Where are the problem classrooms right from the beginning? So that really helped us. This is again, Instascope scans. We reel it in the classroom in the morning, come back at, uh, at recess, pull it out, go to the next classroom, come back at lunch, pull it out. So we get multiple air exchange rates of it in the classroom. So helped us get the outliers as soon as the kids came back. And it said, you know, where's the line? What's the average? What's the, what's the priority line for deployment of engineering controls? So the district really liked that because it helped them prioritize their resources for what do we focus on first in terms of co-exposures what, what's normal, what's not, and what do we prioritize for engineering interventions? Where will HEPA filters help and where will they not? So that's kind of the, the corollary to that story. Okay, I got a quick text question. Um, and, and I think it's a good one to make sure we're all on the same page here. Do, do they, did the listener understand correctly the Instascope can differentiate between one bacteria, two mold, three viruses in the total bioaerosol load. No, they did not. That's not, that's not correct. Viruses, because of their size, you know, the way they exist in the environment, they're, they're really small, right? They're below microscopic capabilities, conventional. You can't see it with an optical microscope because it's, those things are smaller than the actual wavelength of light, right? They, they can't reflect. But the way we exhale them, the way they exist, they're stuck to each other and stuck to other things in the air. Um, so they present, if you could see them like bacteria, right? These clusters, and we, we've done this in the lab, but have been unsuccessful in isolating individual viruses or viral clusters. So the, the anticipation is that they present like bacteria, although we can't tell them apart. So they're been together, 
right? So small biology, bacteria and viruses are bent together, but you can't separate them. That's not possible. All right, so we, that, do separate mold. We, we do separate the mold and pollen. So correct. three, three pollens basically. Virus, right, bacteria, you get mold. Essentially four bins, right? You get the, the mold, you get the bacteria, you get the pollen, and then you get everything else. There you go, yeah. All okay. the small stuff, right? So right. once you get real small, then you, you lose your ability to differentiate, you know? And that, the exception that we've seen are with spores, with bacterial spores. Those really shine. You can, th those things are incredible reflectors. Um, so the, the two things that we've been able to isolate so far, right? And we've, you know, we can't test everything, but we've tested a lot. Um, Bacillus subtilis spores, and there, that's the biological warfare surrogate, anthrax. Right. We can see right. that alone. We can differentiate that. And believe it or not, it's stacky. Stacky is just an outlier with respect to optical particle recognition. We don't know why. So we have a reasonable confidence you can see stacky separate from everything else, but there's a lot of everything else. <laughs> so, right. so it's really this, this microbiological storm with the inter engineering interventions, whether it be containment, water loss, or whatever, you got to knock that storm down. With it comes COVID. With it comes stacky, that kind of thing. So that that's really the the conglomerate engineering approach and usefulness as a tool that I see that we've been successfully able to leverage in the schools. I got one more text question. Then I want to get it over to Cliff. In most IAQ surveys, there is a comparison between outdoor air and indoor air or between non-affected areas and affected areas. Do most of the people using Instascope follow that same kind of, uh, you know, process in trying to figure out what areas have, are of concern? Yes, the algorithms look at all of that together and it'll tell you right away the affected areas. Okay. So if you do you get a 10 room house, you're doing all the rooms. Very good. Cliff? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Um, going back to, to John, you, know, you had mentioned that you know, your initial interest with this was mold and you know, service master organization was an early adopter. Um, you know, a significant amount of their work you know, is, is water damage, probably the majority of it. However, fire damage comes into play as well. And it would seem to me that it would be easier to identify uh, particles such as char, soot, and ash because they can do that under a microscope. So it would seem to me that, um, you know, can this device do it? If so, uh, it would seem to me that you're gonna have uh, another uh, opportunity line there in terms of fire restoration, you know, clearance, you know, what's there, uh, you know, determining, you know, you know, did plastic burn, did it not, you know, after wildfire, you know, all, all sorts of things. And, and it would seem to me that Again, I'm not a scientist and I don't understand the machine, but it would seem to me that some of that stuff might be easier uh, because they're doing it now with, you know, particle counters and microscopes. Well, and, and it's a good question. It's interesting. And yes, I agree with that use case. And in fact, Mark has done, I'll ask him to speak a bit here on what he sees in fire. It is something that we would like to do more work on, like water, to have mm -hmm. that as an added feature. But at this point, it has not been an emphasis. If we had customer call for it, it might become a higher priority. But Mark had some interesting, because um, I believe he has done some work in fires and, and looked at what these particle signatures are comprised of. So Mark, can you weigh in on that? Sure. Um, first of all, unfortunately, we're all gonna face that, right? Uh, just there's gonna be an in increased incidence of wildfire. Those particles penetrate residences, businesses, and so on. There's no doubt about it, right? at least in the scientific community. Uh, the political community has arguments about global warming and wildfire occurrence, but I'm not gonna go there. Um, in any event, we have done research on the biological components of wildfire and why, why you would think, you know, whatever's in a wildfire in a wildfire plume would, would burn. It actually has got a fair amount of biology in it of all kinds. Um, so uh, in that sense, I do think Instascope might be useful. I actually haven't used Instascope for wildfire indoor and outdoor assessment comparisons. Um, we've used conventional means. Uh, the, the particles in wildfire are unique. It's got a mix of, of obviously uh, black and brown carbon soot of, of various degrees of oxidation, some of which can fluoresce. 
So that, that research has yet to be done um, and needs to be uh, to, to isolate the usefulness of Instascope as a tool to actually you know, separate wildfire components from background residential indoor or commercial indoor dust and so on to, see, to look at this penetration potential. So I, I actually think wildfire components probably have their own unique signatures that have yet to be realized. Um, so that's research I would really like to do to look at you know, the, the special fluorescent signatures associated with wildfire penetration into buildings. That's a, that's a whole new area. We've done that with other fluorescent techniques but not using Instascope in real time. Um, I don't want another wildfire in my backyard to be able to do that. Um, we'd actually have to get, you know, put together a traveling show, move Instascope to those sites and actually do it, but I don't wish that on anybody. Um, so is it going to happen? Yeah, but we'd have to really stage to do that research. And I don't want a wildfire in anybody's backyard, uh, but we know they're coming. So what, what about, what about internal fires? You know, when the fire occurs, uh, in, in different a building, than, yeah. very different than wildfire cliff. Okay. Yeah. I mean, different burning temperatures, different materials. Um, it, it's, it's a whole different animal. I, not all soot is created equal. I'm depends sure. on you know the fuel the temperature the oxygen supply it fire science is fascinating but the the resultant particles are very different depending on the construct the combustion process start to finish mm -hmm. yeah we got a, a hazardous material like asbestos same thing yeah uh, asbestos are fibers so it's very right. different uh mm -hmm. different microscopy haven't haven't tried it yet don't expect fluorescence but unique Optical signatures, yes. Thank you. I, I got a quick text question, Mark. Um, does the your fluorescing spores for fungi? What about spore fragments or fragments of bacteria, etc.? Are they picked up by Instascope? Well, you know, Jeff uh, Charlton just texted. I, I did a quick answer to him. I can't keep up with everybody's text, but um, <laughs> it's it's really size matters, right? Once you get too small and a fragment, right? If you're a bacterial fragment, you're already probably too small to see with okay. a regular microscope or, or instascope. Fungal fragment, possibly depending on the size, but um, that, that have to be systematic. So once you get, you know, once you get submicron, things get less confident, right? Gotcha. We can't tell the difference between a fungal fragment and a bacterial spore or something like that. Um, so, uh, I, 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 the confidence is in around that. I, I can't, can't say fragments you can see. Which is true for just about any type of analysis we do. It's very difficult to pick up those spore fragments. Yeah, true. All right. What about, I want to finish up here. We got about 10 minutes left. We're, we're going to just not even go to the roundup. Let's just go for it. Um, one of the questions is on calibration of the equipment. And I want to mention training on the equipment as well, because I think obviously that's very important. By the way, I also want to mention for those of on online right now, we've done other shows with, with Mark and with uh, a couple other people. So those kind of had more of the basic foundational information in them. We'll reference them in the blog, but um, what about the calibration? How often does the instrument have to be calibrated? Is it necessary to recalibrate prior to starting in a new facility or location? And what kind of training do people get with the instrument? Uh, calibration John, I think is that's twice. A good one for you. Yeah, calibration is twice a year. The training, it, it's very simple to operate the instrument. The length of time in training is going to be somewhat dependent on the operator's knowledge of the built environment. Okay, so we, we've had some people a day and a half, other people a matter of hours. So, because part of our training is this is what you're looking for, why it would exist, and so on. But the actual use of the instrument, very simple. And the calibration is twice a year, but is there a, a, like a field calibration at all? Yeah, the field calibration is sent out every quarter, but that's, that's less necessary now based upon new calibration methods, okay? So I don't know, you know, most of the instruments that have come in recently have been upgraded, so I don't know that the field calibration is pertinent to many of them now. Gotcha. I, go I, I, go I, ahead, Mark. This calibration thing's really important, and... Um, I want to give credit to Ann Pering from NOAA yes. now, at, now at Colgate University who came up with um, an absolute calibrant. They used to use uh, yes, latex spheres um, and now it's, it's a chemical uh, yield. So the, the calibration is 
really improved and um, could be a primary standard. And, and I actually want to talk to NIST about that. But that, the calibration's just awesome now and you know, cheap, reproducible, uh, pretty, pretty damn good. Um, and I got to talk to you about the ease of use. Even a professor can use this thing. So you guys, <laughs> you guys could totally use it. Um, uh, it's, you know, it, and you can take it as far as you want to go, right? I can do a deep dive under the hood and get raw data, or I can trans, you know, just use the reports as, as indicators. So, um, you know, I, I'm, it, it's, it's not, you don't, anybody can learn, I, I think. And if you play by the rules, it'll be a useful tool, right? You can also abuse it like anything else, right? If you don't use it right, if you don't play by the rules of engagement, you can't necessarily trust your data. But those use, rules of engagement are simple and uh, common sense things, right? So, um, and, and there, there's different user rules for different cases. You could use it for source tracking or wheel it into the classroom. We take the actual wand off and we use it for a bulk sampler. So there are different ways to, to leverage its strengths, but you have to be aware of its weaknesses and play by the rules. All right, John, let's go to the roundup. All right, uh, Cliff, why don't you go first? Yeah, um, just a uh, follow up, uh, John. It would seem to me that you know you have a diverse diverse bins of users, you know, some that are restoration, some that are scientific and, and so on and so forth. Do you have like users groups for these people so they can kind of communicate and, and uh, among themselves and share knowledge? There is a user group and, and a few of them have additionally emerged. Ron Morrison, our director of sales is the best in contact to keep up with all of those. One component on this is we now have what's called the total bio app. So we've been toggling back and forth in this discussion a little bit from the classic mold, which is its own app, to the total bio app. So that has opened up a number of use cases and different users, depending on the information, including restaurants, which we didn't talk about this, this uh, go around. But um, you know, that we, we, can, we can look at effective occupancy based upon the bio loading. Well, there's a lot we didn't get to, unfortunately, John. I would love to have gotten more, but Mark, I've got one more quick question before we go. Um, you were doing some work, as I understand it, on HVAC systems cleaning. And yes. Can you just kind of summarize for us, give us the abstract on what happened there? Yeah. Um, so we, we've had two sites working with NADCA pretty closely on this. Um, and the NADCA's put a, a good investment in objective science uh, in and around cleaning. Um, so we've taken two sites, very different climates, one in Vermont, one in uh, Pearl, Mississippi, uh, which we recently finished. We're going to do a, another one in the desert Southwest. So we have a diversity of geography, but short story is it does look like cleaning affects long-term particle exposure in occupied spaces. We have hard data on that from Vermont. Unfortunately, COVID precluded getting that data in, um, Pearl, Mississippi, but we're doing another site in the Southwest. So we'll have real-time monitors, including Instascope, monitoring particle load in the occupied space before, during, and after and cleaning to look at those exposure effects. And I assume this is cleaning following the NADCA standard, not just going in and, you know, banging the ductwork and so on. No, 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 no. These, that's, that's what NADCA is all about, right? Yep. Professional, reproducible, objective, they, and they, they were real careful uh, working with the data. They were fantastic industrial partners, I have to admit. Um, just worked with some really talented practitioners with NADCA. Um, class act uh, operation, great leadership. Um, so they want objective science, just like John wanted objective science in and around Instascope, its fundamental operations and deployment potential. NADCA is playing that same game, working with the universities and, and being very careful about it. Uh, this, so it's pretty awesome. And this was cleaning the entire system, the air handling unit, all the duct work, all the terminal, et cetera, right? Yes, yes. But they did it in a staged way, right? So they could isolate the effect of duct cleaning, did oh. the coils, did the blowers, did the ducts in a staged long-term. This wasn't an overnight, you know, wham, bam, we're done thing. It was, it was thoughtfully done to isolate the effects of duct cleaning. And, and they chose sites that had identical systems, right? So two systems identically operated over a long-term cleaning one, not cleaning the other. So they had legitimate controls. Interesting. Very, very, interesting. 
Very interesting. Uh, the, love to talk to you more about that. Maybe we'll get another show down the road with the NADCA folks. But uh, that's that information great. that this industry has been looking for for a long time. All right. Before we go, anything you'd like to add? Let's start with you, John. Did we miss anything? Anything you'd like to add before we go? No, I appreciate Joe and everybody that listened in. Um, any other questions, we're available to, to answer them. Yeah, there were a couple we didn't get, get to, uh, but it sounds like, Mark, you were answering some on the side there. I, I tried to keep up with everybody, but there's a, a ton of great questions on there. I, I responded to Jeff and Topher and a couple as, as, as fast as I could when... I'm not, I can't talk and write at the same time, right? I'm, I'm pretty limited, uh, <laughs> pretty limited multitasking capacity as my wife tells me. Stick with one thing at a time and you'll be okay. Understood, understood. There was one about HEPA and the HEPA will, yeah, the bioaerosol two to five particle counter, where was the HEPA? Oh, where were the HEPAs located? Did it matter where the HEPAs were located? Sure does. Air cleaning? Yeah, mm -hmm. you know, we had a partnership with the Carrier Corporation on this. And they've gotten into, and there, there's some out there, this, there's a great new generation of HEPA filters that have a radial intake design. Um, they're really quiet uh, and the teachers love them. But yeah, it does matter. You want them as centrally placed as you possibly can. Obviously with kids in the classroom, that can be a challenge. But the radial intake on these has two effects. One is 360 degrees intake. So if you do get stuck against a wall or cornered or something like that, you can still have a good impact on or a, a good uh, uh, representative intake. Uh, so that, that was cool. And it reduces the noise, the radial intake. So th there's a dynamite generation. They're affordable, a few hundred bucks each, so on. You know, we it does matter. Show, yeah. I'll bet it was 10 years ago, a company was developing a radio intake, a HEPA air cleaner for construction. And I was wondering when it was going to take off because I, I just thought it was excellent. We tested it. It came out really well. I'm glad to hear that type of technology is being uh, developed and advanced right now. You, you want to challenge a piece of equipment, throw it in a K through 12 classroom. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> I, I've got a follow up for you, Mark. When you were using the HEPAs, one of the slides that I, that I thought was very interesting that you showed with the classrooms, you had a picture of a, of a little, it looked like a pedestal fan or, or something like, like that, that was in the room. And I think you were, um, oh yeah here's a picture right here i'll yeah. show it. yeah um so, so the question is when you're using these hepas in the classroom are you using uh another i i, I saw that but then there was another picture that was um oh a, I graph, a graphic and yeah and, yeah yeah it, it would seem very important that uh perhaps people do that if you're gonna right there if you're gonna use yeah. the hepa should are, are you um, recommending the use of a small fan like that in conjunction with the HEPA or not? Uh, what we found was a lot of the rooms are not well mixed. They're, the ventilation system can't operate as designed because right. particularly I can say in Colorado in the winter, right? Mm -hmm. If you've got ceiling supply and, and return reservoirs, if they're close together, even if they're not, warm air comes in, stays up there and goes out, never mixes right. with the classroom. So you need a little bit of turbulence to okay. actually mix Absolutely that room fun. air, that's what that designates. But what's cool about the HEPAs is, um, is they actually put a fair amount of energy into the room air to help the room air mix and the ventilation system do its job better. Mm -hmm. So that, that's why I put that little icon there. I'd say 40% of the classrooms we've surveyed are poorly mixed. They're, so they're, they short circuit. They don't, they don't really work as designed. And what's nice about the HEPAs is they have enough energy, you know, they're 50 watt fans in there. Right. Um, to do it quietly. That's mm -hmm. the other. And a distributed network of small HEP is better than one big ass one in the corner, right? Right. Okay. Excellent. Wow. Great stuff, guys. Thank you so much. Uh, John Lovett, Mark Hernandez, Dr. Mark. Uh, really appreciate you guys joining us today. And uh, great time. I also want to thank my co-host, the Z-Man, Cliff Zlotnick. Great John, show, you got to have faith at the controls. Our growing group of loyal listeners will be uh, next week. We're going to do a flashback show. Buildings don't lie with Henry Gifford. And then in two weeks, we've got a follow up on the moisture mob series uh, with the restoration industry, global watchdog. He's setting up some really nice um, case study type, you know, my case study versus your case study type show on the moisture mob series. <laughs> so we'll be back in two weeks with that. Thank you all for joining us. 
And we'll see you in two weeks live, but we'll be back next week with the next episode of IAQ Radio Plus. For IAQ Radio, I'm Spike Reed saying thanks for listening.